All right. Hi, everyone. In case you're unsure what Zoom room you're in, you're in the Goddard Exoplanet Seminar um, Zoom meeting right now. And our speaker today is going to be Christoph Lovis from uh, the University of Geneva. He's going to be talking about high contrast, high resolution spectroscopy of exoplanets with VLT Restretto. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and let Christoph take it away, and we'll hopefully have some time for questions uh, and discussion at the end. Thanks. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to give this talk uh, today. So thank you for, uh, for inviting me. So indeed, I'm going to talk about the Ristretto project, which I'm leading at the University of Geneva. And essentially, uh, Ristretto um, uh, will be about uh, the atmos atmospheric characterization of Earth-like exoplanets in reflected light. That's really the, the science motivation behind this whole uh, project. And so I'm going to first go through a little bit the, 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 the why we, we, uh, we, we, we chose this approach uh, for, for, uh, for this instrument. So as you probably know, there are not so many ways, observationally speaking, that you can hope to, to uh, characterize Earth-like exoplanets, temperate rocky exoplanets in the habitable zone. Um, it's very tricky, it's very difficult, the contrasts that you have to overcome are, are, are huge, uh, the angular separations that you have to resolve are really tiny, and there are many other challenges that you have to overcome. So the, the technique, the approach I would like to advocate today is uh, about using uh, what we call high contrast, high spectral resolution uh, in, uh, in, in reflected light. So first of all, let me explain a little bit the why, why, what does it mean, this high contrast, high resolution technique. So in this slide, I'm just describing a bit the, 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 the idea here. So on the right plot here, you can see um, a stellar PSF, uh, as you would see through a, uh, through a telescope equ equipped with an AO system. And you can see a companion a planet here at uh, fictitious uh, values about 0.6 arc second, but it would be in principle much less than that. And so you can see here uh, a flux ratio between uh, planet and star of about 10 to the minus seven, which actually correspond to what we uh, would uh, deal with uh, when we have a temperate rocky planet in the habitable zone around the NEM dwarf. This is typically the contrast ratio that you would be aiming uh, for. And so the idea is that uh, with the AO system, you will, of course, obtain very sharp PSFs that are diffraction limited, so limited by the, by the telescope size and the wavelength of observation. And so uh, assuming that you can resolve spatially the two objects, uh, planet and star, uh, you can hope to apply this technique in which uh, we are not necessarily aiming at fully resolving. I mean, we, we are aiming at fully resolving, but we are not aiming at uh, getting rid of all the stellar light at the location of the planet, which is what you would need if you would go for direct imaging, where indeed you need to get rid of all the stellar light somehow to reveal the planet. Here, we are not talking about imaging, but about high resolution spectroscopy. And um, so it's really a two-stage process. So the idea really here is to boost a high contrast system by coupling it to a high resolution spectrograph. So uh, the, the trick is that the second stage, this high resolution spectrograph uh, will help because uh, the, the planet light uh, will be spectrally separated by the spectrograph based on its distinct spectral content and Doppler shift. Because at high spectral resolution, of course, we can play with Doppler shifts. We can see the different velocities of the bodies we are observing. And since a planet has an orbital, like a certain orbital velocity, which is, uh, which is significant, we can hope to disentangle the stellar spectrum from the planetary spectrum thanks to this uh, Doppler shift. So this is really the, the idea we are pursuing. And so somehow we can relax the requirements that we put on the AO and high, high contrast system thanks to this high resolution spectrograph. Because the, the bottom line here is that we are trying to do something from the ground here. The idea is really to, what is the best ground-based technique uh, that we can hope for to, uh, to, to tackle the challenge of uh, temperate rocky planets. And from the ground, 
I think it will be really difficult to go for, uh, let's say, plain direct imaging and achieving the contrast of 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 10 that uh, we have to achieve uh, for, 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 for such planets. So, uh, what, and then we also want to do that in the visible and near infrared range uh, because we are aiming at the reflected light. So the, the stellar light scattered by the exoplanet. So there is a lot of information that can be retrieved by, uh, uh, from this uh, approach. Of course, we are measuring the geometric albedo versus wavelength. And if you take the Earth as, as an example, you can see a low resolution Earth reflecting spectrum here. You can see many, many spectral features from mole molecules in the Earth's atmosphere, like uh, H2O, uh, O2, O3, CO2. Um, and this is a low resolution uh, spectrum. If you, I hope you can see my, my mouse, if you focus on this little uh, feature here, that, that would be the oxygen uh, 0.76 micron line at, uh, at high spectral resolution, as you can see here, resolved by the espresso uh, spectrograph, you see that it is made of a forest of very narrow and spectrally resolved here uh, absorption lines. So um, this allows you the high resolution approach also allows you from the ground to, uh, uh, let's say, um, get rid of the telluric absorption problem. So uh, of course you will have telluric absorption on top of that when you are uh, observing an exoplanet, uh, which is what you see here. And thanks to the, Doppler, the different Doppler shifts between the line systems, you can also hope to, uh, to get rid of these, uh, at least uh, to some large, ex to a large extent, to this telluric absorption issue that will plague any ground-based observations, when, especially when targeting molecules that are present in our own atmosphere. So uh, this leads us to the following plot. This plot here shows you the expected reflected light contrast of all known exoplanets. So I simply took the list of known exoplanets um, and I compute uh, for each of them the maximum angular separation from the star, uh, so at maximum elongation. This is simply the semi-major axis divided by the distance to the system. And I, I, I plot on the y-axis the expected reflected light contrast for the planet, which is given by this formula. It is basically the planetary radius over the semi-major axis squared times the geometric albedo and the phase function. So I had to assume some fiducial values for these, uh, for these um, parameters here uh, uh, for, for the sake of the exercise. But uh, this is what uh, you get. So you can see, and also the, so the, 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 the dot size is proportional to the planet mass, uh, roughly, roughly. And also the color is a equilibrium temperature scale, as you can see on the right uh, here. So there are a number of interesting things that you can see from this plot. Uh, first of all, um, there are a few objects that uh, that are really promising, that are really uh, that have a favorable uh, contrast and angular separation. Just for example, these two here, Gliese eight seven six B and C, these are two giant planets orbiting a nearby M dwarf, and you can see that they clearly stand out in terms of uh, of contrast. That's because they are giant planets mainly, and also angular separation. That's because they are orbiting a very nearby star mainly, and also because they are on, uh, let's say, uh, relatively wide orbits. Um, so uh, a very important thing to bear in mind from this plot are the vertical dashed lines that you can see here. They give you the angular separation, uh, the angular resolution of different telescopes at different wavelengths. Uh, you can see here the VLT in the I band in the visible at uh, the, the two lambda over d uh, limit uh, in I band in the VLT, which is here. And then you have two lines uh, for the e European ELT, so the 39 meter telescope uh, in I band and in H band. Uh, again, the two lambda over d limit, which we consider as the smallest possible inner working angle that, that, that we need. So you, you can see an interesting thing is that Proxima b, our nearest neighbor and also uh, closest uh, temperate rocky planet uh, stands out here at uh, an expected contrast of about 10 to the minus 7 and right on the 2 lambda over d line uh, at the VLT. So it is actually the discovery of Proxima b that led us to develop this Ristretto project, the, the, the fact, the recognition that actually Proxima b could be accessible with the VLT. We don't need to wait for the ELT, we could already 
uh, try to detect it with the VLT. Of course, then there is the ELT uh, coming up. And with the ELT, we will uh, expand the accessible parameter space by a lot, as you can see here. Uh, all uh, there is a bunch of planets that will become accessible that would not be accessible today with 10 meter plus telescopes. So um, um, uh, yeah, this is based on this plot that we are going to develop the, the main science case for uh, Ristretto and also the target list for the instrument. Uh, let me just add a few things about this technique that we want to, to, uh, to use. Uh, so just in terms of the planet population we are talking about, because this is quite different typically from transiting planets that maybe most people are used to uh, today. Uh, here we are really addressing a completely different population. Uh, it is, uh, first of all, these are planets that are really close to us. They are really orbiting the nearest stars to us. They are our immediate neighbors, uh, contrary to transiting planets, which by construction are farther away because the transit probability, uh, transit geometry uh, uh, is, is, uh, uh, implies a low, uh, low uh, probability of transit. So the vast majority of the objects that I've just shown before are not transiting. Um, it's also a cooler population than typical transiting planets. They are typically on wider orbits. And uh, in particular, uh, we could say that we have an easier access to the habitable zone. Uh, also because transiting planets uh, in the habitable zone, they tend to have rare transits. Um, depending on the host star, but uh, uh, if, the, if there is one transit every few months, then of course it limits quite strongly your ability to uh, characterize the object. Um, so it's a diverse sample in terms of mass and irradiation. And uh, also the reflected light geometry is in general more favorable to probe deeper atmospheric layers than the transit geometry. So there are a few advantages here uh, of, uh, of this approach that I, I wanted to highlight. On the other hand, there are a few things very important that will allow us to carry out our observations quite efficiently. The basic thing to understand is that we are aiming at known planets. By known, I mean that they have, most, most of them were discovered by radial velocity surveys. And so they have a quite well-known RV orbit, which means that we know the epochs of maximum elongation and also the value of the maximum elongation of these planets. We know the orbital period, the semi-major axis, the eccentricity, the argument of periastron. All this is known. And from these parameters, you derive these, these, these two things, which are really critical to schedule your observations. Because you want to observe, of course, when the planet is at maximum elongation to maximize the angular separation on the sky. And also, at that moment, even if you do not know the orbital inclination and the uh, position angle on the sky, it's not a problem because at maximum elongation, you know the value of the maximum elongation just from the semi-major axis and the distance to the system. Um, so this means that we know when to observe and at which angular separation we expect to find the planet. Um, and so also an additional benefit from this is that if we can detect the planet directly, uh, in reflected light, then we will immediately lift uh, the, the orbital inclination degeneracy and get the true mass. From the minimum mass that is already known from RVs, we will get the true mass just by, because we will be able to measure the projected orbital velocity and combine with the known RV orbit, you get, you get the orbital inclination and the true mass. Okay, so that's where Ristretto enters the game. So Ristretto is designed as a pathfinder instrument for reflected light spectroscopy at the VLT. So on an eight meter telescope. So we, we need that mirror size to be able to access Proxima B at two lambda over D. It's really the minimum telescope size that we need. Um, so Ristretto will be made of the following elements. Uh, so for the telescope, obviously the VLT, then uh, a fast uh, extreme AO system based on a near infrared pyramid wavefront sensor to uh, have a really good uh, AO correction. I will detail that a little bit more uh, uh, afterwards. Um, after the AO system, we need to inject the light into the spectrograph, but we need to collect the light in the focal plane at two lambda over D from the star. So we will have an IFU, an integral field unit, made of seven hexagonal spaxels, as you can see here, 
overlaid on top of the PSF, on the diffraction-limited PSF. Um, uh, and so we are going to play some optical tricks to add some coronographic capability to this IFU that I'm going to detail also afterwards. And this IFU is going to feed a, a bundle of single mode fibers. And these single mode fibers will convey the light to the visible high resolution spectrograph. So I'm going to uh, detail that a little bit more uh, afterwards. First of all, let me go to the target list that we are aiming at for Stretto for this reflected light uh, science case. So the plot you see here um, was uh, generated from the exoplanet sample that I was showing before. And um, instead of, so on the x-axis, you still have the maximum angular separation as before. But now on the y-axis, we have the, the exposure time, an estimate for the exposure time needed for detection of the planet. So it is, uh, in fact, the number of nights uh, at the VLT for detection, where detection in this case would mean the SNR of five on the cross correlation function of the planet, which means the reflected light spectrum, the, the, the stellar spectrum reflected by the planet. This is uh, the metric we are using here, which is one possible metric. It doesn't say everything, but is the most obvious one to, to use. So you can see that here we have one night of VLT time, and here 10 nights uh, on the left. So on the other hand, you have this vertical dashed line, which uh, is the two lambda over D um, line at the VLT in I band. And you have this uh, shaded area here that you can see that is centered on two lambda over D, which gives you the sensitivity uh, of the off-axis spax cells. The off-axis ex hexagonal spax cells, they are going to be able to couple the planetary light, not only when the planet is exactly at two lambda over D, but also when the planet is a bit offset from that. And this is what uh, is illustrated by this uh, 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 shaded uh, gray uh, area here. Now, what you can see, um, there are a few objects that would be, uh, the, uh, let's say, the uh, first targets that we would attempt with Ristretto, in particular the two Blizz 876 planets uh, that I already uh, discussed before, they could be detected in just a few hours of observations because of their high contrast. Um, so that would be a first, the first time that uh, Jupiter-like planets, these, these are basically called Jupiters, uh, quite similar to our own Jupiter, would be the first time that we can characterize Jupiter analogs directly uh, in reflected light, actually with any technique, because there is no technique at the moment that is able to, well, there are maybe trans, the transit technique is able uh, to do that for a few, very few objects that have uh, very long orbital periods, but uh, the sample is very limited. So here it would be uh, first time we could characterize the atmosphere of such uh, objects in reflected light. And so, um, as you can see, there are a diversity of objects. Uh, there is also a super Earth uh, sitting here, Vis 887C, that could be characterized in a few nights of VLT time. This is a seven Earth mass object. So that would be also super interesting to, to characterize. Um, and then there is, of course, Proxima B. Pro Proxima B is here. Uh, it is, of course, challenging because, it, I remind you, it is a temperate, rocky planet in the habitable zone. Uh, and this would require, according to those estimates, about 40 nights of VLT time, which obviously is a lot. But if you think a little bit about it, I just would like to make this comparison with the upcoming ELTs. Um, uh, 20, uh, 40 nights of VLT time is equivalent to two nights of ELT. And as you may know, uh, the characterization of habitable exoplanets is the major science case for the ELT. So nobody would be shocked uh, if we say that we will need two nights of ELT to characterize uh, Proxima B. So why should people be shocked by 40 nights of VLT time, right? So I'm trying to make that case that uh, everything we can learn already with the, with the VLT and with the new technique should be, should, should be done. And uh, I also would like to stress that there are other objects that we will be able to detect, uh, also objects that are further away than the two lambda over D analysts. Uh, that's because, of course, this is just the maximum angular separation from the star. But uh, planets can be observed when they are uh, closer, angularly speaking, to their star. Uh, 
Uh, and since we know the orbits uh, quite well, except for the orbital inclination, which uh, introduced a bit of degeneracy, but it's not that bad, we can actually wait for these planets to be at the appropriate um, orbit, uh, angular separation to observe them with, with, with ristretto. Uh, so that's the case, for example, of some giant planets here. You could just stay, uh, observe them at other orbital phases, and you gain on the two fronts because uh, as they go towards a superior conjunction, they will be th their disk will be more fully illuminated, and the contrast ratio with the star will be better. So you gain uh, you, you you gain also in contrast, and so in ex in exposure time, that's why the arrow that I uh, that I, I show here is going down. Um, okay, so there may be something like ten objects that could be characterized with Ristretto for the first time ever. Uh, that we could access this planet uh, population. Now, let me address a few additional science cases that we are also developing for Ristretto. We want to have uh, as broad a science case as, uh, as possible. And another science case that uh, I think is really interesting is the detection and characterization of accreting protoplanets, so very young planets, uh, using uh, H alpha, the H alpha line, uh, which is uh, one of the main. Um, uh, accretion diagnostics in, in forming protoplanets. So uh, here there is a prominent example that we can use is P the PDS-70 system. As you may know, uh, two planets were uh, discovered around this uh, very young star, and uh, they were indeed detected in H alpha uh, with, uh, for example, with VLT News, which is an integral field unit uh, spectrograph at the VLT but offering only uh, relatively low resolution spectroscopy, but, uh, but uh, a very, uh, very nice uh, IFU capability. And so you can see on this map that you see here, uh, when you actually differentiate um, two images taken, taken in the H alpha line and just um, in a wavelength outside the H alpha line, you are able to get rid of the stellar spectrum and you are left with the remaining emission that does not originate from the star. Because everything that is the stellar spectrum uh, could be subtracted uh, using a star-only spectrum. And you are left with SPAC cells where you can see uh, something else than the star. And this something else is actually two planets uh, here. And you can see the little spectra on the right. So you can clearly see a prominent H alpha emission uh, uh, that originate in an accretion shock around these uh, protoplanets. So the H alpha line is really interesting because it is within the spectral range of Ristretto. And um, contrary to Muse, Ristretto will be able to spectrally resolve it. And uh, uh, spectrally resolving it may bring a lot of uh, additional science that you can make. That you can make. So we attempted to simulate what could be uh, an observation of PDS-70 with Ristretto in an attempt to be as realistic as possible and um, uh, evaluate the capabilities of the instrument. So, um, so first of all, we managed to retrieve an actual HARPS spectrum from PDS-70 to have an actual high resolution spectrum of the H alpha line, of the stellar H alpha line uh, from HARPS. Um, then we okay we we managed to flux calibrate it uh, in an appropriate way and then we also need a planet uh, uh, H alpha emission model which we get from uh, uh, the work of Aoyama et al who provide uh, such models for uh, accreting protoplanets and actually um, he was kind enough to provide me with a model that was uh, fitted to the actual properties of PDS-70b, in particular the H alpha, the actual H alpha luminosity of PDS-70b as observed by news. So this is as realistic as it, as it can be. But this uh, model is able to generate a high resolution version of the H alpha line, contrary to news, uh, which only observed the uh, low resolution. So uh, then I, we were able to build the simulated star plus planet spectrum in the H alpha region. And so we can also simulate the AO performances of Ristretto uh, that could be achieved on, on this star, which is quite faint. It is uh, quite fainter than, quite a bit fainter than, than Proxima, uh, but still, okay, we can close the loop, the AO loop on, on it. And then we can actually generate uh, an observation of this system 
with uh, Ristretto. On the right, you have a, a plot that shows you the uh, different um, um, hydrogen emission lines that you expect from these accretion uh, shocks uh, uh, of uh, because of the, the accretion flows uh, onto the forming uh, protoplanets. And you can see that the H alpha line, uh, this is a logarithmic scale here, uh, H, H alpha line is really prominent and a very interesting diagnostic uh, that would be matched only by the Lyman series of hydrogen, but is uh, in the UV, so it's not ac uh, accessible from the, from the ground. Uh, so from the ground, the HL ion is really interesting. So here is the simulation. You see a little piece of spectrum uh, centered onto the um, HL ion, uh, the stellar one. Uh, this is what you can see here. It is spectrally resolved, but since the star is uh, uh, rotating quite fast, and um, so it's a very broad emission line. Uh, in orange, I added the model planet spectrum, and you can guess it by eye here which is already quite amazing because usually when you add the planetary contribution to the stellar one, you just don't see, any, don't see anything because the contrast is just too high. I mean, you, usually in direct imaging, you have contrast at the 10 to the minus five or six level, which obviously you wouldn't see by eye. Here, you, you do see it by eye. And the reason is simply that, I, this is a zoom just to show you better. The reason is simply that at H alpha, the planet two star contrast is as high as 10 to the minus two. Very locally, spectrally speaking, you can reach this 10 to the minus two contrast, which is uh, incredibly large. Uh, so now what you can do with the uh, uh, Ristretto, you will have a star only observation that you can get from, for example, from the central spark cell that would be centered on the star. On the other hand, in the off axis spark cell, you would get a star plus planet spectrum. You get the planet spectrum, but there is also some, uh, of course, stellar halo that you cannot remove uh, uh, completely. But using the uh, star only spectrum, you can scale it and remove it and fit it to the star plus planet spectrum, uh, fit it and remove it uh, to reveal the uh, planetary absorption. And so basically you do blue minus, you do orange minus blue essentially on this plot. And uh, this is what you get uh, with Ristretto, a simulation uh, uh, of, of an observation of a one hour observation on PDS 70. And so uh, now the scale here is in kilometer per second. So we are uh, uh, across the H alpha profile, uh, the Doppler velocity across the H alpha profile. We get a spectrally resolved profile of the planetary accretion shock. Um, that you could then fit with the models and try to derive the planetary accretion rate or the velocity, the velocity fields in this uh, accretion uh, region. And so, of course, it is quite noisy, as you can see, because there was a realistic white noise that was uh, added here, but it's still a very significant uh, uh, detection. And what is also interesting is that in this case, on purpose, I did not simulate the planet at the, the real location of PDS-70b, but I actually put the planet in the, at two lambda over d in the off-axis spark cell of Ristretto, which correspond to much closer distance to the star of three to five AU. So actually with Ristretto, we can probe the region um, uh, uh, around three to five AUs um, to, to search for additional planets possibly uh, closer to the star. And this is particularly interesting uh, because um, these correspond to distances where you would expect that most giant planets uh, are, are form. Uh, and so I think this would open uh, a really uh, interesting parameter space. So just as a summary, um, we would get a spectrally resolved detection of the planetary H alpha line. We could constrain the properties of the accretion flow, accretion rate, planet masses, uh, um, uh, and, and planet mass as well. Uh, and temporal evolution of the accretion process, uh, etc. And uh, since the uh, off-axis spark cells of Ristretto are at around 40 milli arc seconds from the star, uh, you can really reach uh, the region with fewer AUs from the from the star. So this is something we, a science case, we want to develop uh, further uh, in the future. Then there is a third science case that I want to briefly describe today. Uh, this, is, this is about the solar system. Uh, what 
could we do with Ristretto on solar system objects, uh, having in mind that we can combine high spatial and spectral resolution. Um, so we want to play with this high spatial resolution, which is uh, would be quite unique in, in, in this case. Um, so you could imagine uh, this as a sphere, you know, the sphere instrument on the VLT, for example, or GPI, they could uh, reveal uh, quite some details at the surface of solar system objects, but in imaging. And Ristretto could do the same, but in, in high resolution spectroscopy. So to illustrate a little bit what, what we're talking about, I'm showing here the Io, uh, Io the, the moon of Jupiter, which has an angular diameter of 1.2 arc second, typically. And I project on the sur uh, surface of Io, the uh, IFU of Ristretto that you can see here, just to show you the scale. So uh, it means that uh, thanks to the Io system, we would really be able to spatially resolve the different regions that are probed by the IFU uh, that you can see here. And so uh, interestingly, the scale corresponds to the, to, the, to the surface features that you can see on Io, like volcanoes, for example. So maybe you could do something interesting by actually uh, exploiting the spatial resolution coupled to uh, the high resolution, uh, the high spectral resolution. Same exercise for uh, Europa, um, one arc second of um, angular diameter. Uh, this would be the size of the Ristretto IFU projected on uh, Europa's surface. And uh, same thing for the two ice giants, uh, Uranus and Neptune. So it's very tiny here, I hope you can see it. Uh, because their angular diameter is uh, quite a bit higher, 3.8 arc second and 2.3 arc second. So here we are facing maybe some, we need to check that we can close the AO loop on these big objects, because when you observe an uh, um, um, uh, angularly resolved object with an AO system, it's uh, not necessarily uh, easy for the wavefront sensor to, to close the loop, so we would need to, to check that. But we could also do some, maybe some interesting science uh, on some local structure or structures at the surface of this, uh, well, in the atmosphere of these uh, planets. So, but this is still with a lot of question marks. I have to say I'm not an expert, a solar system expert at all. So please forgive my, maybe all of, all of this is a bit naive, but uh, at the moment we are just at the stage of uh, throwing a few ideas here. So uh, for example, we could imagine, imagine some local wind measurements through Doppler shifts in reflected light because uh, a Ristretto will have a decent uh, radial velocity precision. So we can measure the radial velocity of the reflected light. And so we could uh, measure some local wind pattern on, uh, for example, uh, Uranus and Neptune. So maybe we could make some local measurements of chemical composition uh, provided we there are interesting uh, spectral uh, tracers in the passband uh, of Ristretto, which is in the visible, so it's maybe not optimum, of course. Local measurements of surface reflectance. We could study in more details the volcanoes on Io, the surface activity on icy moons, maybe, uh, Titan's atmosphere, a seismology of Uranus and Neptune. All of these with question marks, these are really just ideas uh, at this point, and surface properties of uh, minor bodies and uh, comets, rather. Um, okay, so that was the third science case that is the less, uh, least developed one at the, at the moment. Now, in the remaining time, I just would like to show you some more instrumental aspects of Ristretto um, that uh, we are working on at the moment. So, uh, uh, in particular, um, uh, so uh, we uh, derived some top level requirements uh, from the Proxima B science case, which is driving the requirements. So the spectrograph will have a spectral range from 620 to 840 nanometers. So in the visible red spectral region, uh, it will have a spectral resolution of 140,000. Uh, so the inner working angle of the system will be two lambda OD, as we said already. We are aiming for a total transmission of the system uh, higher than 5%. And we want a planet coupling into the spac of axis spac cells of more than 50%. We want a star coupling of less than 10 to the minus four in the external uh, uh, spac cells, uh, because we want, uh, of course, a higher rejection of the stellar light. And from these uh, top level requirement, we can derive the pre preliminary design for the, for the instrument. So let's go quickly through the various parts. Spectrograph uh, to start with. 
This is uh, the optical design of the spectrograph. It's a, it's a classical uh, cross dispersed HL spectrograph, but it is a diffraction limited design. It is uh, fed by seven single mode fibers uh, that you can see on the right. You have the spectral format from the blue here to the red uh, with the different spectral orders. And you can see that each spectral order has this, the seven little spectra from the seven spark cells on top of each other. So that will be the, the spectral format. Um, so that's the, let's say, the optomechanical design uh, of the spectrograph. You can see here, it's, the spectrograph itself uh, is relatively compact, about uh, 60 centimeters of length for, for the optics alone. Then there is uh, all the detector head with cryo cooler, which takes some uh, space. And then everything will be embedded, will be inside a vacuum vessel for better stability, temperature control, and pressure uh, control, so that we don't uh, we have a really stable spectrograph. And so the whole thing is represented here in uh, also an isolation box and the electronic cabinets that you can see here. And um, uh, so that's it for the for the spectrograph. Um, then the integral field unit, we are at the prototyping, prototyping stage here. You can see on the right our first prototype. It's quite tiny. Uh, you can see the bundle, well, you can see the micro lens array that was specifically 3D printed on top of the fiber bundle. Um, and um, so the difficulty here is that uh, so we go for a standard seven fiber bundle, but then we have very tight tolerances on the fiber core alignment. Uh, I mean, the fiber core is uh, just a few micron uh, in size because these are single mode fibers. And so, so you need a perfect alignment of the lenses, the micro lenses on top of the fiber core. And this is not easy, but uh, Vanguard Photonics in Germany was, has, a, has a printing process that that is able in principle to do that. And so we had this first prototype that we could test. Um, so there was a little uh, problem with the alignment, so with the specifications to be more uh, to be more correct. So I think we identified the cause of the problem, uh, which uh, uh, impacted the, 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 the throughput. And we are now going to develop a second prototype where we fix this uh, issue. And um, uh, so that will be for the coming uh, month. Uh, just one note that I didn't address before, we have these seven SPAC cells, and of course we are not covering with full efficiency the full analysis at two lambda over D, so the strategy would be to do each time to do two observations, rotating the IFU by 30 degrees, and then for symmetry reasons, by rotating uh, uh, by 30 degrees, you then get a homogeneous sensitivity uh, on the two lambda over the analysts around the, the star. So that's the strategy we're going to, to pursue. Uh, then there is the, the chronograph part. On top of the IFU, we will be using um, what is called a phase-induced amplitude apodizer uh, that allows us to maximize the planet coupling while minimizing the stellar coupling. And this is done by reshaping the telescope PSF so that you have many narrow airy rings uh, within the span of the off-axis fiber. And then we can, uh, we can obtain some nulling effect. So the, the, the stellar light, which is centered on the optical axis, will be nulled on top of the single mode fiber and so this will allow us to uh, increase significantly the rejection of stellar light in the off-axis spark cells, thanks to this uh, nulling effect. On the other hand, uh, the PSF of the planet, which will be uh, at 2 lambda over D, is still uh, sufficiently good to be well coupled into the uh, fiber at 2 lambda over D. So we get a very decent coupling into the fiber for the planet. Um, so uh, we are now uh, designing this, uh, this system. And uh, OK, I'm going to skip this because I don't have much time. Just, I just want to highlight the fact that the main difficulty we've identified so far is that because we are so close to the star at 2 lambda over D, we are really sensitive to low order wavefront aberrations. And so we will have to control or to minimize these low order wavefront uh, aberrations to a very small number. Uh, about 10 nanometer RMS, and this is something we're working on now. So we believe that the um, 
uh, turbulent residuals can be controlled by the AO system to that level. But of course, we should make sure that the non-common path aberrations are also uh, uh, minimized and kept below that level. And this is another matter, and we are uh, actively uh, working on, on that at the moment. OK, so I have to move on here. Uh, just to show you some um, uh, more com 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 complete simulations of the whole system uh, comprising uh, the, the real VLT pupil, the AO system, the PIAA apodizer, the diffraction limited IFU, and the coupling into the single mode fibers. So you have these two figures of merit. On the left, you have the coupling contrast of the star into uh, well, the stellar rejection, if you like. And on the right, you have the planet coupling. Um, so uh, you can see that with, um, um, so we can determine from that the number of actuators that the AO system uh, has to have, and also the speed that the AO loop is, uh, needs to run to be able to reach uh, sufficient performances. And we, you can see that following the simulations, it is possible. So uh, in particular, uh, if you have, you need at least 32 by 32 actuators, which is feasible. Uh, it's typically what the sphere instrument uh, has uh, today at the VLT. Uh, you need to go fast uh, because uh, you uh, need to control turbulence uh, really fast uh, uh, when you work so close to the star. You need to go at least to uh, two kilohertz uh, for the AO loop. And uh, so there are a few uh, other things that I don't have time to, to mention. But uh, let's say that this is achievable, technologically speaking. Uh, we are now investigating which uh, uh, manufacturers are able to, to, to do that. We have already ordered, we will use a, F, a CRED1 camera for, from FLI for the wavefront sensor. It is already ordered. And we are working now on the deformable mirrors that can uh, fulfill these requirements. Uh, but we are confident that this the level of technology exists today on the market to, to do that. Finally, I uh, would like to jump, I have a few more minutes, to jump to uh, uh, some more long-term considerations, just, just to place Ristretto in a broader context. Uh, we are not doing Ristretto just on its own. We are doing it because we believe that this is the future uh, for ground-based astronomy in terms of uh, characterizing temperate rocky planets. And so the future is with the ELTs, as you know. And in particular here uh, in, uh, on the European ELT, we are build, will be building the Andes uh, spectrograph, which is the visible near infrared high resolution spectrograph for the European ELT. And uh, the uh, science goals of uh, Andes uh, uh, fe feature prominently the exoplanet atmospheres cases. So uh, as priority number one, uh, it was identified that exoplanet atmospheres uh, through transmission spectroscopy should be uh, the, top, the, the, the top science case for the instrument. But as you can see, there was also a third priority, uh, which is exoplanet atmospheres via reflection spectroscopy uh, with the potential detection of biosignatures, which requires AO. And it is priority number three only because it requires AO, which is technically very challenging on the ELT. If it was not for AO, I think it would be priority number one. So this is really also very high on the priority list for Andes. And, uh, but we have to remember that this is a very new technique, which has never really been deployed so far. So my, 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 my approach here is to say that we should we should not go directly to the ELT with this technique. This is this is too too challenging. We really need a pathfinder first, and Ristretto can play the role of the pathfinder for this technique on an eight meter, ten meter class telescope. So it's really in that spirit that we are building a Ristretto, not only to detect or characterize Proxima B, hopefully, and a few other uh, exoplanets and things, but it's really uh, considering the the future with the ELTs. And just to tell you that when you perform the same exercise with the ELT uh, in terms of target sample that you can address, um, uh, I am highlighting his in, here in gray. So again, you can see the number of nights for detection on the left versus maximum angular separation. I am highlighting in, in gray now here a number of known exoplanets that are temperate rocky 
uh, that could be characterized, that are known today, that could be characterized uh, with Andes. So you see that we go from one single object, Proxima b, uh, at the VLT, to actually a population of temperate rocky planets that we could characterize with Andes, which fully justifies this uh, uh, technique to be uh, 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 identified as uh, one of the top level science cases. So it's really uh, in that spirit that we are uh, developing that. And so uh, let me quickly um, uh, also bring uh, some uh, longer term perspectives on what we could do with this technique, uh, high contrast, high resolution spectroscopy. Uh, this is just the abstract of a paper exploring what, what's going on with oxygen, molecular oxygen, uh, when you increase the pressure, the surface pressure of oxygen on an exoplanet. Uh, in particular, if you think about the runaway greenhouse case, where you would have a massive oxygen atmosphere that is being left over after the runaway uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, the, the runaway greenhouse phase, sorry. Um, uh, and so whether we can we could disentangle an Earth-like atmosphere with one bar of oxygen versus a post-runaway atmosphere with, for example, 10 bar of oxygen. And this is really interesting because at high spectral resolution, you can really see the difference because of this uh, collision-induced O2O2 absorption that would make that will make the oxygen bands. Um, actually um, very broad and will uh, the, the, the high resolution structure of the oxygen band will disappear and it will just be a broad band without any high resolution structure and you, you can see it for example on the on the right here um, uh, let me let me let me see let me pick an example you have the gamma band the oxygen band at 0.63 micron um, after this, uh, so in, in, in blue, you have the one bar Earth-like case where you can see the high resolution structure of the oxygen lines uh, here. While uh, in orange, you would have the case of a 10 bar uh, post runaway case. Because of this collisionally induced absorption, there is nothing left. So, uh, well, there is very tiny structure here uh, that you could also, you can also see that for the 0.76 uh, case uh, here. But so this means that um, um, this could be a discriminant uh, between these two cases because uh, with the high resolution technique, uh, if you have a one bar case here, you will be able to detect the oxygen signal provided you have enough signal to noise because you will detect the, the cross, correl in, in, in cross correlation, you will detect the high resolution band structure of oxygen. So you can, you can tell that there is not, there, there is a one bar or let's say there is not a huge quantity of oxygen in the atmosphere. While if you don't detect anything, but you can see that uh, actually this is a, the, the albedo, the broadband albedo in that region is very low while the albedo goes up on both sides. Uh, you could see, okay, I have a dark albedo there, and uh, I am not, I'm not detecting anything there, but I can see that the albedo uh, is higher uh, on the left and on the right. Then I may be in the case of uh, uh, high oxygen content uh, atmosphere, and for sure you would exclude uh, one bar atmosphere of oxygen. So, okay, uh, that was just to show you some additional things that you could do at the ELT. This, of course, is for the ELT, not for the VLT, because this goes really beyond the, 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 the simple detection. And I will uh, finish with this uh, final slide, uh, Ristretto in a nutshell. So uh, what is Ristretto? It is uh, basically about high resolution spectroscopy at the diffraction limit of the telescope. Uh, it's a new capability in astronomical instrumentation, and we should see it uh, that way. It will pioneer reflected light spectroscopy of exoplanets, including uh, Proxima b, and it is a pathfinder for uh, Andes and uh, uh, on the longer term PCS at the ELT. And it will also do other things, uh, uh, characterization of accreting protoplanets using H-alpha, uh, maybe ground uh, studies of uh, small scale structures on solar system objects, uh, in terms of schedule and project uh, schedule in particular, so uh, we expect that the construction of the spectrograph will start by the end of 2022. Uh, and uh, this is the most advanced part of the instrument. So there is actually two parts that we are uh, that are progressing at different speeds. 
the, the spectrograph is uh, more, most advanced and it's almost ready to, to be built, uh, while the front end uh, will take uh, longer. Uh, so the first thing we will do once we have the spectrograph ready, we will be able to validate and test it uh, together with the IFU on the Swiss 1.2 meter telescope in La Silla. Uh, because it's a diffraction limited instrument, you can actually install it on any telescope that is equipped with an AO system. Uh, the size of the telescope, provided it is diffraction, it provides diffraction limited PSF, does not matter. So we will install it uh, on, on this telescope as a test bench. And we aim to install the full system as a visitor instrument on the VLT by the end of 2025. So this is important. Ristretto is not, uh, let's say, um, a facility instrument as like ISO usually does, it would be in this case proposed propose as a visitor instrument. It allows us to be more flexible, to address a more uh, a, a focused uh, science case, and uh, also uh, that uh, requires some uh, R&D to, to be fully uh, mature, uh, which is usually not possible for facility instruments. Uh, and so we have this fl additional flexibility that we need uh, with the visitor instrument approach. So I uh, just want to say that partners are still welcome to further develop uh, the science cases and also the AO system, which is quite complex and very challenging. And uh, so we have a web page where you can get uh, the latest news on the, on the project. Thank you very much and sorry for taking a bit long. Uh, no problem. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, a lot of interesting information about Ristretto and um, obviously little hints of ELT instruments as well. Um, I'm going to open it up for, we have time for a couple of questions. Please raise your hand uh, if you uh, would like to ask a question. I see Chris, you have your hand up. You can unmute and go ahead. Great. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, so I was, I was wondering if you could uh, sort of conceptually explain something to me, you know, the, the photon arrival rate for an Earth twin, um, even Proxima Sen B is very low, even in broadband. Um, and so when you talk about uh, spectral resolution of over 100,000, you know, the number of photons in each of those individual lines is going to be either zero or some random integer number based on your Poisson draw. So when you do a cross correlation function, with that very noisy high resolution spectrum, how do you account for that Poisson draw? Is it, is, is it a special type of cross correlation that you need to do? Or is it just, you know, you do a standard cross correlation with this ran, you know, randomly generated Poisson draw and, and it's, it's the standard technique? Yeah, so in this case, we you you are right. Huh? Uh, what you say is correct. So per spectral bin, there will be a very small number of uh, photons uh, hitting the detector. So first of all, you have to think uh, of this as uh, as faint object science, right? So we are we are going to do one hour exposures. Uh, that's the maximum we, we can do before reading out the detector, really because we are aiming at a very faint target, because as you say correctly, the planet itself is, is very faint. So uh, there will be only a few electrons per hour hitting per spectral beam hitting the detector or not even one. But well, it's a bit of the, let's say the magic of the, uh, of the thing here is that no, we are aiming at standard cross correlation in the sense that um, essentially we are co-adding the spectral beams uh, doing the cross correlation. Uh, so um, in terms of photon noise, uh, there is no drawback compared to, let's say, broadband broadband uh, imaging. Uh, the, the price to pay is, of course, the readout noise, because you are going to use a number of pixels that is much, much higher. But of course, we are not attempting to detect the planet in one spectral bin, as you, as you, as you know. We, we, it's only detectable because we are going to co-add thousands of spectral bins, because we are going to use thousands of individual spectral lines. Uh, on the reflected stellar spectrum or on molecules uh, in the atmosphere of the planet. So uh, the simulations that I showed are based on, I think, 1,000 spectral lines, which, by the way, is not extreme because, uh, in the, 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 as you know, the, for example, the Proxima Sen spectrum itself is a, is a, is a late M-dwarf, so it's full 
of narrow spectral lines. So it's quite well suited to, to cross correlation. And uh, so we can benefit from that. But essentially there is no, there is no miracle. We need the photons. So we need to, 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 to uh, co-add all these spectral beams to, to get enough photons. And so we, I included the, the readout noise and number of pixel problem in the simulation. And indeed, we are close to be readout noise limited, but not quite in this simulation, but we have to be careful. So we, we need really to use the smallest possible number of pixels on the detector, because otherwise it's an issue. So the dark noise becomes an issue. Do you include, do you include the motion of the planet? So Proxima 7b has an orbital period of 11 days. So you're saying you needed 40, 40 nights. I mean, even the motion over an eight hour integration is non-trivial. Non yeah, so it's uh, 11 days. So there are actually two nights per or orbital period where you could observe it at maximum elongation. And during the night, the change is sufficiently uh, small that it's not going anyway. You're doing one hour exposure. So within one hour, the smear is negligible. But uh, you can use the full night every 5.5 days, so twice per orbital period. You can use the full night to get maximum elongation. And so I, uh, over the observing season for Proxima, you can get, I estimated that in my paper in 2017, uh, um, maybe 10, uh, the equivalent of 10, 15 nights. So to get the 40 nights, you would need uh, three years, three observing seasons, uh, on, on uh, two to three observing seasons, if I remember correctly, to get there. Thanks, Christoph. Um, I see Michael. Uh, Michael, you have a question. Do you want to read it out or would you, um, otherwise I can. You can read it out. All right. So the question is, can you tell us if you can observe some of the closer in Trappist planets like 1, B, C, and D? I'm sorry if you addressed this at about for a moment. And if possible, would the exposure time scale like the 40-day VLT versus the two-day ELT uh, you mentioned? So for the first part of the question, whether we can observe Trappist 1 with Ristretto, is that, was that the question? Yep. Uh, no, actually, no, because uh, so Trappist-1 is transiting. It is at 12 parsec. The planets are very uh, close in orbits. And so uh, the VLT and even not even the ELT is not going to uh, angularly resolve the Trappist-1 planets, unfortunately. Um, their angular separation from the star is too small. That's the problem. And for the second part of the question, I'm not sure to... Well, it doesn't matter, but thank you so much. I just I just missed it. You're, you're well within your inner working angles, what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think the second okay, question, cool. if you could. Um, any last questions? Otherwise, I think we should... Otherwise, uh, Christoph can be contacted by email as well. But um, no, definitely, oh, we have one more question. Uh, well, Vlad, go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah. thanks for an interesting talk. Yeah, the one question or comment I have, it's about the... Uh, Probably, you know, uh, this technique can be used also for imaging the stellar coroni in the infrared because we have many lines that are, you know, of the of the high ion, ionized uh, ions or like iron uh, in 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 that range and also H alpha, you know, the filaments, those large filaments. If your star is like about ten parsecs, with the resolution of like a milliarc second or a few milliarc seconds, you can resolve the structures. Um, about like uh, one stellar radius, right, and, and that's main sequence stars. So yeah, we, we might not, I don't know how well it can be used for the exoplanets, but for the planet hosting stars and how they interact with exoplanets, that would be an exciting opportunity to see that all those structures and um, uh, the, the, um, the, the filaments that can, you know, from, from, from our data, we get this idea that those filaments can be pretty large, might be greater than one so, so stellar radius. Okay, thank you for the input. That's a really interesting uh, suggestion. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the time we have for right now. Thank you so much, Christoph. Uh, really exciting um, to hear about kind of this work and then kind of the plans for a lot of this. If you do have more questions, uh, you can definitely contact me by email. Um, and otherwise, I guess we'll, we'll be waiting, you know, excitedly. So uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.